Well, happy Easter, everyone. Welcome to Cross of Life. We're so glad that you came to celebrate uh, with us today. You know, I was thinking uh, about birthdays the other day. How many of you remember birthdays anymore? Ever since Facebook has started to post people's birthdays on the side of our news feed, it's been a lot easier to not really care about people's birthdays until the actual day. I actually know a, a person who uh, didn't want to put their birthday on Facebook, um, but Facebook then auto-generated a birthday for them. And so at one random day throughout the year, everyone says happy birthday to this person. It's not their birthday. Um, you know, my mom, she used to have a book, a big book with all the birthdays in it, and every month she would copy the birthdays onto the calendar on the fridge so we would know. But how many birthdays do you remember? You probably remember the birthdays of people who are close to you, right? You remember your kids' birthdays, your spouse, your parents, siblings, maybe a couple of close friends. But that's probably it. For those birthdays, you'll pull out all the stops, right? You'll bake a cake, you'll buy presents, you'll make a card, whatever it takes to celebrate that birthday because that person is significant to you. And I think the same thing is true about Sundays. You know, if you're not a Christian, Sunday is like any other day. Maybe it's a little different in that you don't have to go to work, so you get to sleep in a little bit more, but otherwise, it's a pretty normal day. But for some reason, hundreds of millions of people, every Sunday, get up, put their clothes on, drive or walk to some location where they volunteer sing songs, give their money, and listen to some guy monologue for half an hour. Why would they do that? What's so great about Sundays? Well, I think if, if you don't understand why Sundays are so important, it might be similar to the reason why you don't remember everyone's birthday. Because there are some people in your life who are more significant than others, right? And so you remember the day they were born because that day is significant. What I hope to show you is why Sunday is so significant. By introducing you to a person who makes the day significant. At Cross of Life, we're starting a new sermon series today that's going to go for the next five weeks called Visit. We're going to explore what Sunday means to Christianity. We're going to talk about why Christians gather on Sundays, what they do on Sundays, why they do those things, what the benefits are for them. So we hope you can come to the whole series, but today we're just going to focus on why Christians worship on Sunday. Because you know they didn't always. They used to worship on Saturday. In fact, for thousands of years they worshiped on Saturday. Maybe you know this word, the, the word Sabbath. Uh, the Christians, before about 2,000 years ago, worshipped every Sabbath, every Saturday. And they did this because uh, Jesus, or God, when he created the world, created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. So you have six days, starting with the first day of the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The seventh day of the week. And so mimicking their God, Christians worshipped on Saturday. They took time off from work to just spend the day worshipping. That is until something really crazy happened. The Christians started worshipping on Sunday. And you can imagine the scandal, right? Like thousands of years of tradition gone in a matter of seconds. Why would they do that? Well, in order to understand why the Christians started worshiping on Sunday, after thousands of years of worshiping on Saturday, we have to go back about 4,000 years to the story of a man named Job. Job had everything. He had it going for him in every category. In fact, many people called him the greatest man in the Eastern world at that time. He had hundreds of cattle. He had a huge house which fit his 10 children, which sounds like a financial burden in our day and age, but, but Job, Job was so rich that he could provide parties for his 10 children in that house weekly. Job had everything. Until that one fateful day, when the servants came running up and they told him, all of your cattle have either been stolen by raiders or killed, 
And while we were running to tell you that, we found out that your house collapsed with all 10 of your children in it, and they're all dead. In a moment, it was all gone. But it got worse for Job. A couple days later, his body burst out in terrible sores, and his wife left him. And so there was Job, the greatest man in the Eastern world, penniless, sick, and alone. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I know you're going through something. Everyone's going through something. I'm going through something. It's the thing that my mind runs to when I have a few extra minutes. It's the thing that keeps me up at night. Whatever it is for you, I'm sure it's not as bad as what Job went through. But I'm guessing it's probably similar. For some of you, like Job, it's a money problem. You maybe have lost a huge amount of money on a deal gone wrong. Maybe you're not sure if if the money's going to run out before you die. You're not sure if the expenses will get paid because the money going out seems to be more than the money coming in. You're not sure how you're going to pay for those big costs that are coming up, like, like school and housing and cars. Maybe you've hit rock bottom. You declared bankruptcy. And you're not sure what it's going to take to pick up the pieces. Or maybe like Job, your problem is with your kids. Maybe you've lost a child, either to a miscarriage or an early death. Or maybe your children are still alive, but you see them going down a path that you are sure leads to destruction. Maybe it's like your kids are living in the same house as you, but they might as well not be the same family. Or or maybe your kids are grown up and you wish they would start acting like adults, but they're not. Maybe your problem is with your spouse, just like Job's was. Maybe the papers aren't filed, but the relationship is dead. Or maybe the papers have been filed, the divorce has gone through, and now you're trying to figure out how to live alone again. Or maybe it's not a spouse, maybe it's a close friend. A relationship that you really value that is slowly but surely cracking. Maybe it's sickness. A sickness that you're going through. A sickness that you can't seem to escape. Chronic pain that plagues every day of your life. Or you're watching a loved one go through that same type of struggle. Whatever it is for you, I'm sure it leads you to react the same way Job did. See, the part of Job's story that I told you is just the first two chapters of the Bible book of Job. The whole book of Job is 42 chapters long. And 36 of those chapters are Job asking the question, why? Why, God? Why me? Why now? Why this? Why for them? Why can't you just change it? It's probably a question you've asked too. Well, Job has the answer to whatever your problem is. And it's from this short section right in the middle of the book of Job, which is actually the centerpiece, the main point of the entire book. You know, in a Western mindset, we kind of think that a book should sort of start small and grow until it's peak towards the end of the story. Um, Hebrew literature doesn't do that. Hebrew literature focuses on the center. It's kind of like an X, right? It starts outside and focuses in on a middle part and then mirrors it on the way out. This middle section, Job 19, right in the middle of those 42 chapters, are the most important words that Job says in the entire book. And I hope to show you that they are the key to whatever you're going through. So we'll read from Job chapter 19, um, starting at verse 23. Job says, Oh, that my words were recorded that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. 
how my heart yearns within me. This is God's word. So Job's answer to the question of why is a short little phrase that you just sang a whole song about. I know that my Redeemer lives. And I hope to break that phrase into three parts for you and teach you three different things about the Christian faith and about why Christians worship on Sunday. We're going to break those three thoughts this way. I know my Redeemer and lives. We'll teach you that the Christian faith and Sunday mornings for Christians are rational, personally transformational, and eternal. So, Job says, I know. And I hope that you'll see that that makes the Christian faith rational. I mean, you know, it's hard to know anything anymore. Uh, We all kind of come to just about every piece of information with a certain level of skepticism, right? We've seen too many advertisements, too many fake news, too many fine print to believe anything at face value. It's kind of the plague of our society at this time in the world's history, at least that's what historians tell us. How does anyone know anything at all? And you know, the criticism will come against Christianity often that Christians just have blind faith, right? They're believing kind of into the abyss about this sort of deity that watches out for people and takes care of them. But that claim is, first of all, not true, and second of all, not fair. First of all, that claim is not true because Christianity is actually based on facts. Now, I don't have time to expose all of the facts that Christianity has in its favor. I did that actually for an hour last week in Bible study. But there are a lot of historical facts about what happened outside Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago that you can track down that aren't in the Bible. I encourage you to actually go after the evidence and and try to find it. Christianity isn't just a philosophy that we're all kind of agreeing with and hoping makes our life better. No, it's, it's a historical event that we actually know happened. But secondly, a claim that Christianity is based on blind faith is, well, not really fair either. Because if you hear the rhetoric of most people when they talk about what they believe, most of what we believe tends to be based on blind faith to some extent or another. I mean, you hear this, right, when people talk. Uh, they'll hear an argument or they'll hear a, a piece of evidence and they'll say, that resonated with me. Like, it doesn't matter if it's actually true or not, it just it made sense to me, right? That's why people will say, in my experience, in my opinion, right? Because we have made ourselves the ultimate source of truth. Whether a fact is backed up by sources or not, we're pretty sure we're the ones who get to decide whether something is true or not. If anything is blind faith, that's blind faith. Because if you look back at your life, think about all the things that you believed were true at some time or another. To simply believe something because it makes sense to you, that's blind faith. But Christianity isn't that. Christianity is historical, evidential, and provable. In fact, if you're taking notes with us in your bulletin that you received on the way in, that's the first fill-in-the-blank for today. Uh, The Christian faith is in facts. And facts do not fail. This is why Christianity is particularly a frustrating religion, I think, for a lot of people. Because Christianity doesn't really care what you think of it. It doesn't really care how you feel about its teachings because it's not based on a philosophy that's ever-changing, an ideology that fits with the culture. No, it's based on facts. This is what happened. This is what it means. And I wish I could give you all the evidence, uh, but they don't let me preach for more than 35 minutes or so here. But I want to give you one piece of evidence that I think is particularly compelling from Job's story. See, Job says he knows that his Redeemer lives. Not he hopes, not my Redeemer might live. No, I know that my Redeemer lives. And if Christianity is just a philosophy that sort of makes people feel better about their lives sometimes, well then Job should certainly not believe in it because it is not working for him. His life is at rock bottom. And if Christianity is here to make you feel a little better about yourself, fix your finances, fix your health, goodness sakes, it's not working for him. And yet he believes it. 
He knows it. And that rock-solid foundation of actual facts is what's getting him through this absolutely terrible experience in his life. Look, if what gets you through the toughest portions of your life is an attitude of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, try to put on a positive face, that's only going to last so long. But if your foundation for getting through the toughest things of your life is based on facts, then it doesn't matter if you don't sleep well or get up on the wrong side of the bed or if everyone hates you or if it's all your fault because it's based on facts. So for Christians, Sunday morning is completely rational. You know, these Christians that gather here, the regular attenders of Cross of Life, they don't come here because they always feel good about it. Sometimes they wake up and they feel awful. Sometimes they show up and people are here that they're not exactly excited to see. Sometimes they spend their time here and the whole experience doesn't really make them leave refreshed. But they don't come because it makes them feel good. They come because it's true. And whether they feel like it or not, Christianity and Jesus' resurrection don't care. So Christianity, the Christian faith, and Sunday mornings for Christians are deeply rational. But they're also personally transformational. Um, You heard Job say it, right? He says, my redeemer. You know, the, the narrative of our culture right now when it comes to forming who you are as a person is basically um, assert whatever you want to be and then go chase it, right? Name it and claim it. Be whoever you want to be. Don't let anybody stop you. Dream big, you know, this sort of idea, right? Except for that doesn't really work because every one of us needs someone else to validate our opinion of ourselves. This is why you have things like safe spaces, or why everyone's looking for community. Every one of us is looking for somebody else to say, yep, you're valuable. I like the way you are. I want you around. In fact, it's nearly impossible for someone to assert something to be true about themselves and keep it up if no one acknowledges that it's true. Like, just to give you a totally dumb example, um, if you're going to dye your hair a certain color, you ask somebody else what they'll think of it before you do it, right? Or you make sure that you look up other people who are popular or well-liked who have done the same thing with their hair first. Because you need validation. But actually, you need a little more than validation. You need validation from somebody who is valuable. See, it's not enough for just the bottom of the barrel sort of folks to acknowledge you. No, you need somebody who is valuable to validate you. Let's say again that you you dye your hair a certain color and a homeless man in the street says, ah, I like your purple hair. That's nice of him, but it's not that valuable because most people don't make a habit of having conversations with the homeless folks on the street. And so who's going to know that that guy thinks your purple hair is cool? But what if somebody valuable thinks it's cool? What if an athlete or a musician or a celebrity of some sort sees your purple hair and is like, that is awesome. Here, let's take a selfie together. I'll post it on my Instagram. Well, suddenly, you're far more validated because that person is valuable, right? That's the concept of the redeemer that Job is talking about. The person who sees him as valuable. You think about how you redeem coupons, right? What are coupons? They're pieces of paper that you think are valuable, so you redeem them, right? Job's redeemer sees him as valuable. Now, who is this redeemer? Well, you know, it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the man who was also God, who came back to life for Job. God happens to be the most valuable person in the entire world. His validation of you is more valuable than anyone else's validation of you. If God thinks you're valuable, it does not matter what anyone else thinks of you. The God of all worlds looks at you and says, you're worth my time, you're worth my life. Wow, that changes everything. And the truth is that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not just Job's redeemer. He's your redeemer. 
He's the one who sees you as valuable, valuable enough to put his own life on the line and die on a cross so that you could live, to come back to life to prove that he was God so that you could know that his sacrifice was good enough for you. And the Bible says in numerous places that Jesus' death was for the sins of the whole world. Are you part of the whole world? Then Jesus' death was for you. That the most valuable person in the whole universe has validated you. That's why Christians come to church on Sunday. Because out there in the world, there's not a lot of validation. Sure, your, your spouse might val- validate you sometimes, your, your boss might, your coworkers, your kids, but they aren't perfect at it. They don't give you everything you're seeking for. Sometimes they're inconsistent or actually work against that validation, right? And so Christians come here for the personally transformational message that God Almighty values them. That's a message they're hearing nowhere else in the world. But they're hearing it here on Sundays. And you can too. If you're not a regular attender of our congregation here at Cross of Life, we would love for you to come back again next Sunday. And here again, that God validates you. That God, the most valuable person, sees you as valuable. If you're taking notes with us in your bulletins, that's the second fill in the blank. The Christian faith is for you. Finally, Christianity is not just rational, not just personally transformational, um, but it is eternal. This is the heart, core, and center of the Christian message. That because Jesus is alive, Christians will continue to live. That Jesus was crucified on a cross outside of Jerusalem, and his resurrection guarantees that we will resurrect also. That's why we titled the the sermon today, Sunday is for Resurrections. Because yes, on the first Easter, Jesus resurrected from the dead. But every Sunday, that same message is preached from this stand and in churches across the world. And every Sunday, souls are resurrected from being what the Bible says, dead in sin to alive in Christ. And that doesn't stop when the end of the world comes or the end of your life comes. See, the same message of Jesus crucified and alive for you continues into eternity. Because like we talked about on on Good Friday two days ago, Jesus' death is your death. The Bible says that you were connected to Jesus in his death so that you have already died and you are now living an immortal life that's going to continue into heaven and into the world that will come. The Bible says very clearly that at the end of this world, God is going to destroy this earth and build a brand new one for us, where we are going to live with our real bodies. I mean, you heard Job say it, right? In my own flesh, I'm going to see God. My eyes will see him and no one else's eyes. And you're going to live there forever with people and culture and experiences and food and everything that's awesome about this life, but it's perfect. There's nothing that slows you down There's nothing that leaves you in pain. There's nothing that breaks your heart because that's what God wanted for you. And that's why he was willing to die. The Christian faith is absolutely eternal. You know, it's kind of like that feeling you have when you look back on your life and you have those really great memories that you'll never experience again. Some of you know this. Before I was a pastor, I was a professional musician. I toured for three years with a worship band going around playing at churches. And I did that with two of my best friends, uh, one of whom is a pastor now in Miami, Florida, and the other one is a pastor in Madison, Wisconsin. We did that for three years, and it was three of the best years of our life. We still get together via Google Hangouts, and we talk about the fun times and tell the old stories and reminisce. Maybe you've done something similar with your friends but we'll never get it back. I don't know if you've noticed, but Madison, Miami, and Mississauga are not exactly close. 
And even though a pastor's schedule is relatively flexible during the week, he has like a really important appointment that he needs to be at every Sunday morning. So it's never going to happen again for us. And it breaks my heart. Because I love those guys and I loved doing that thing. Maybe you have a memory like that. You look back, like when you were younger or when the kids were younger or when you were with your friends all the time, when you had that possession or had that job or were living in that place, those moments were so good, you wish you could soak them up more. But you can't because it's over. Heaven is the restoration of that feeling. It's bringing back all the things that we have lost, all the good that we threw away by our sin. That's why Christians gather on Sunday morning. Because for just a short hour, they get to feel that again. They get to feel the presence of God, to hear his word, to be with people that they wouldn't have run into if it had not been for church, but they are looking forward to spending a perfect eternity with. The Christian faith is absolutely eternal. And if you're taking notes, that's the third fill in the blank. The Christian faith is forever. So why did all those strict Christians stop worshiping on Saturday and start worshiping on Sunday? Well, because 2,000 years ago, Jesus rose on Sunday. And that changed everything. He was the Redeemer that Job was waiting for and that we've always needed. And because Jesus was alive on that day, Christians have been coming back Sunday after Sunday to hear that same rational, personally transformational, and eternal message that Jesus still lives. But if you're not convinced, uh, let me give you one more argument for the validity of Jesus' resurrection. You know, there's a problem that every one of us has that we cannot solve. It's the problem of death. 100% of people die. And even though 100% of people die, it doesn't make us feel any better about it. It's the most universal experience of the whole human condition. Every one of us has watched somebody we care about die. And yet we can't get over it. We don't know what to say. When we see it coming, we don't know how to deal with it. It's because our, our brains were never programmed to die. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created it absolutely perfectly for humans to live and live and never die. But like a computer that's been infected by a virus, we're going haywire. We're dying, and we can't figure out how to stop it. Now, I don't know what you do when you have something wrong that you can't fix, um, but I personally search it on the internet, right? I search on Google or Yelp or something like this to find somebody who can help me with my problem. Whether it's my plumbing or my car or my health, I, I try to find those people who can fix it. And if you're like me, you don't settle for one or two star reviews. You look for the five star reviews. The people who actually did the job did it well and did it courteously and punctually. If the problem is death, then the only person who has a five star review is Jesus. Because everyone else has died and stayed dead. Every world religion leader, Every good person, every bad person, they've all died, but Jesus is still alive. And so if you're going to trust fixing the problem of your death to anyone, trust it to the one who has a five-star review, who actually did it himself. That's the final point today. The Christian faith has a five-star review. I pray that by the words that you heard today, your soul was resurrected. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the thousandth time. But I hope that that leads you to come back next Sunday and hear it again. Hear that rational, personally transformational, eternal message that the only one who's ever beaten death beat it for you and gave you the credit. 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.